When Beeple sold a JPEG for $69 million, it forced the world to answer a question. Does digital ownership mean anything? Or are these going to be remembered like tulips? A cautionary tale on the dangers of speculation. NFTs have attracted quite a bit of heat in the last year. Heat that I think is misunderstood. As a 3D artist of nearly 20 years, I've witnessed a growing discrepancy between the value that digital art gives fans versus the value that lands in the artist's bank account. If you watch to the end of this video, you'll learn why small creators are crying out for the very thing that many say they're a victim of. It's not to get rich, but it is about money. Every day the general public spends about half their waking hours enjoying the music, films and visuals produced by some of the world's best artists. But this is a recent phenomenon. 200 years ago, if you wanted to listen to music, you had to compensate the artist directly. If you wanted art to hang on your wall, the only way was to find and pay someone to lay strokes on a canvas. So, as you'd expect, this made art a luxury, enjoyed by the wealthy few who could afford the high cost of production. This changed with the invention of recordable media. For the first time ever, art could be stored, copied and sold cheaply meaning that art was finally affordable for everyone and the artist could sell it to more people outside of their geographic region. But in practice, it also introduced a winner-take-all dynamic where the bottom 90% of artists now struggle to find work. Because if the art is $20 either way, then why not get the best music and the best movies? Store owners were forced to curate their inventory to what might sell which meant that even if you were good, you had to be picked to even have a chance. Author Nassim Taleb calls this distribution extremiston, one with tremendous benefits for the most talented, but punishingly difficult for the rest. Then along came the internet. With low storage and distribution costs, servers could host everything. So now the public got to decide what was popular, revealing a surprising demand for niche categories. And by displaying adverts on the content, creators who previously earned nothing finally earned something, just not enough to do it full time. Spotify gives 70% of the subscription and ad revenue to the musician, keeping just 30% for themselves. And I suspect YouTube is about the same as the payout is about the same. For every stream on Spotify or view on YouTube, the creator gets paid roughly half of one cent which means they need about 1,000 plays just to afford a cup of coffee. And if they want a minimum livable wage, they'll need a whopping 10 million plays. This means that artists with niche styles will probably never be able to do it full-time unless they broaden their appeal to the masses, which is how you end up with slime videos, cover music, derivatives of derivatives, artists appealing to the masses just in hopes of surviving. And believe it or not, it actually gets way worse for the world's digital artists and photographers. Because for some reason, the world has decided if it doesn't have a play button, it has no value. Instagram and ArtStation will gladly display adverts next to your work, but they won't give you a cent of it. Because the apparent value of these platforms is likes, followers, and exposure. You get the platform for free because you're supposed to use it to sell your services. And I would agree, bringing employers to a portfolio is a valuable service to working artists. But it means artists who don't want to work in the industry have to look for money elsewhere. Which brings us to the first distraction for artists, the paywall. If you don't fancy the idea of giving away your art for free, you can do some good old fashioned capitalism, make a product and sell it. You can put your short films on Gumroad, lock your content behind a Patreon tier, sell your music through iTunes, or use any of the hundreds of platforms available today that let you sell digital content how you want. And speaking from experience, this can result in a 1,000-fold increase in revenue per viewer. But what you quickly realize is that when you do this, you become invisible to 99% of the internet. When every other artist is giving away their art to be relevant, you don't really have much of a say in the matter. The other problem is time cost, because it's usually not the art that sells, but products that are complementary to the art, like tutorials or merchandise, which is how an artist who started a Patreon spends 90% of their week on everything but art, live streams, shipping products, managing discords and editing videos. And if you take it to the extreme, you can find artists who had to launch entire businesses just to fund their artistic endeavors. Hmm. It's bittersweet. 
On one hand, free art means everyone, regardless of class, can now enjoy the same art as the wealthy. But on the other, the world gets less art overall and less originality. Which is why so many prominent artists won't shut up about NFTs. NFTs offer a return to the olden days of cash for art with a modern twist. With NFTs, the art can remain free for everyone to enjoy, but one person buys the ownership of that art. Much like a park bench that everyone can sit on, but financial backers get to put their name on. By laying claim to a piece of digital content that the rest of us enjoy, the buyer gets bragging rights, resale value, and a feeling of connection to the creator, who now knows who their biggest fan is. First, let's ask why anyone would buy something that doesn't exist. What you've heard is true. When you buy an NFT, you don't own a file like you would if it existed on your hard drive. You also don't own the intellectual property, which stays with the artist unless otherwise specified. What the buyer gets for buying their non-fungible token is a token that sits on a public blockchain pointing to a file on the web that everyone can enjoy for free. Which is perfectly stupid, but the concept also isn't new. You can find most historical paintings in multiple art repositories online, where they've been professionally scanned and made available in ultra high resolution, where you can right click and save as. And since the paintings are so old, they're often in the public domain, meaning you could actually sell prints of the painting if you wanted to, all while the physical painting sells for millions of dollars. And what surprised me is that the buyer often won't actually receive the art, because the import taxes for art are so steep that the painting could spend its life in a Freeport facility like the one you saw in Tenet, a dark climate-controlled room near the airport with rows and rows of expensive art. The owner could change hands multiple times without it ever moving a centimeter. What the buyer gets after wiring their millions is a certificate. A document that says that they own the thing that the rest of us can enjoy for free online. And while the contract actually represents a physical item, this also comes with additional risk and cost. For example, storing art at a Freeport facility costs about 12 grand a year, plus 1 to 2% per annum for insurance, plus about 100 grand in international transport fees if you want to sell it, and anywhere from 10 to 30% of the sale value when you sell it at auction. And all of this would fall to zero if it were ever destroyed, lost, or stolen. So while some people look at digital art and think that because you can't touch it, it has no value, this is precisely why many believe it does. And with less people viewing art in the physical world today, there's a strong argument that digital art has far more relevance to today's culture. That doesn't mean it's valuable though. That is a question that each of us will answer differently depending on the stories that we tell ourselves. For example, if aliens landed on Earth tomorrow and we handed them a big fat stack of US dollars, they might just use it to start a bonfire. The only reason we value money today is because enough people believe the story that it has value. The same goes for that soft metal we call gold, the sparkly rock we call a diamond, and NFTs. If the world was to wake up tomorrow and decide that any of these were worthless, they would be. The certificate, the token, and the currency are proxies for an asset that some people in society believe have value. Nobody will ever agree on what is truly valuable, but that's how this works. And this is precisely why many people think NFTs could be a scam. Because after all, if NFTs only have value if enough other people believe they do, then there's a strong incentive to evangelize it to as many people as possible. In much the same way that multi-level marketing schemes often require you to recruit your friends. And to be clear, there are countless NFT projects that are honest to God scams. Roadmaps that'll never be fulfilled, wash trading to pump the price, or requirements that you recruit others. All designed to bring in as many buyers as possible for the sole game of finding the bigger fool. But does this mean that all evangelized products are a scam? Not quite. After all, Alexander Graham Bell went door to door with his wacky telephone invention too. And since the phone is pointless unless you have someone to call, recruiting your friends was built into the product. You could argue that currencies and social networks started the exact same way. But the reason we don't call the phone a scam is that they also created a productive value to society, which is key. NFTs need to provide a productive value to the people buying them or they will not hold their value in the long term. And that's actually why I believe NFTs are here to stay, because they already create value for at least one type of buyer. 
There's actually three types of NFT buyers, but most people only know about the first two. The first is the investor. They're buying because they hope that the token will appreciate in value. They might like the project or they might just want to diversify their portfolio. The second is the gambler. They can't really be called investors because they don't really know what they're doing. Lured by the promise of quick money, they're on multiple discords, buying up the latest fad collectible. But the third type of buyer is why I believe NFTs are here to stay. The diehard fan. Diehard fans buy NFTs for the same reason that people buy signed jerseys, limited print vinyls, and front row concert tickets. They buy to signal their dedication to the artist, feel connected to them, show off their good taste, and maybe even resell it one day if their early bets paid off. Now these might sound silly, maybe even shallow, but they're already well-established industries that go back decades. 90% of social media is basically bragging. Bragging about your holiday, your new car, the music festival you went to. Cameo is worth billions for the sole reason of letting fans feel connected to their idol. And eBay gives fans a platform to buy and sell billions of dollars of memorabilia. The reason you don't hear much about the diehard NFT buyer is that, well, for one, it's super early, so there's not a lot of them. And two, nobody clicks on an article titled, Fan Buys NFT for $60. It's hard to spot beneath the record-breaking investment buys, but they're already happening in the arts community. Like a sculptor who sold a photo for 52 bucks, or a 16-year-old blender artist who sold this for about 200 and this for 1100. Or the Singaporean artist who sold her first piece for 2900. All of these people started with little to no followings, so it's reasonable to assume that these were not bought for investment. And for the time put into the art, most of these artists are barely making minimum wage. But for the first time in history, they're selling the actual art, not an external product, not a membership, and not fractions of a penny from ad revenue. The actual art in a way that serves the needs of their fans and their income. NFTs also enable opportunities that were never possible before, like for secondary sales to give a percentage back to the artist, ensuring that the artist is rewarded for their earlier work as their career grows or the ability to create customized content for buyers. Artblock specializes in this by letting creators sell a concept which uniquely generates new artworks each time it's sold based on the wallet ID or the hash of the transaction. Or licensing, like the Board Ape Yacht Club, which gives owners exclusive rights to use their image commercially. So owners could use it to create their own businesses, launch sub-brands, or collect royalties from the merchandise sales. Or voting rights on the IP, so the people most invested in the story can have a say in what the brand does next. And this is just NFT so far. The internet was first envisioned as a better way to send faxes. So in the same vein, we're only seeing NFTs used in the way that we're most familiar with them. So what I've just presented is the optimistic, rosy outlook of NFTs. But it would be disingenuous not to mention the many problems and hurdles to overcome. The biggest threat to NFTs is the complex technology that it's built on. So hyped and criticized by people with perverse incentives, it's hard to know what promises are legitimate and what are fundamental flaws. For example, Ethereum struggles to handle even a small volume of transactions, resulting in huge fees when trying to pay for anything. But the internet suffered the exact same problem at the start. It wasn't until a decade later that servers could feasibly replace commerce. The same could be said about the speculation and its many security flaws. The book How Innovation Works outlines why the version that reaches widespread adoption often bears little resemblance to the first. But on the flip side, books like Bad Blood serve as cautionary reminders for what happens when you rely on it too much. There are some legitimate problems with NFTs that I don't think will be solved anytime soon, like theft. Buyers basically have to rely on social media to verify whether the art actually came from the artist. There are some initiatives to solve it, but they do seem very easy to bypass. Marketplaces could adopt know your customer verification, but they're still probably gonna need to rely on manual verification, just like YouTube does. NFTs aren't unique in this problem, as art sites like Society6 have enabled the same theft for years, but it doesn't give much comfort to buyers who want guarantees that it's authentic. Another issue is security. While private keys and cold storage wallets appeal to the early adopters, not everyone wants to be their own bank. To reach mainstream appeal, NFTs and crypto in general need to have a centralized option for those that want it. And Ethereum needs more security on what code can be deployed to the blockchain.
because right now scammers are able to send essentially viruses disguised as NFTs. And when the owner of the wallet tries to delete them, it automatically extracts funds from their wallet. Yo, this is fake. This is fake. This is fake. This is fake. They popped up in my wallet. I clicked on it to delete it. Immediately, they stole 19 grand. Need fucking help immediately. Not a good look. That said, other problems I'm more optimistic on. For example, the environmental effects of mining will soon be solved by the Ethereum network moving from proof of work to proof of stake later this year. And even if it sounds like an empty promise, all new blockchains already use this technology. So you could sell on them today in one of the most environmentally friendly sources of revenue that an artist has available. Another problem is storage. While blockchains are decentralized, the content of the NFT is often stored on traditional servers, which means they could be deleted or changed by whoever owns the server. But companies like Filecoin, Filebase, and Arweave are solving this problem by storing the files on an IPFS network, which creates incentive for the seeders to keep storing the files indefinitely. So as you can see, the debate for crypto often boils down to whether you think technology is making society better or worse. Tech people are optimistic and the public is generally more pessimistic, especially those who have had their data exploited or businesses ruined. I'm confident that crypto will be mainstream within 10 years, but what I'm not sure on is whether anything resembling today's blockchains will be what we use. Here's what I think the next three to five years might look like. First, collectibles will either face an outright crash or a large readjustment. Since there's a finite number of buyers willing to hedge bets on new IP, it stands to reason it will eventually reach a saturation point. Number two, governments will start to regulate NFT marketplaces to the same degree as they already do for crypto exchanges. They'll require know your customer policies for both buyers and sellers, which should hopefully fix some of the scams and theft that we see today. Number three, blockchains will get more user-friendly and institutions will step up to ensure the funds and purchases, finally making it suitable for the masses. And number four, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify will all follow Twitter's lead, adding NFT features to either let fans buy content on their platform or brag about it on their profile. NFTs currently resemble the internet of the early 90s. It's a wild west of unregulated markets, scammers, and opportunists but it's also one with tremendous promise. For the first time in history, digital artists are selling their actual art, resulting in a surge of creativity. In the last year alone, I've seen more original CG art than the previous 10 combined. A year ago, I could count on one hand the number of professional artists I knew not working at a studio, but today that number is in the hundreds, proving that when artists can sell direct, they can get by with a fraction of the fan base they needed to previously. And best of all, NFTs let the art remain free for everyone else to enjoy, all paid for by diehard fans who get something they couldn't get previously. And of course, I can't make an NFT video without addressing the elephant in the room. Whatever happened to that donut NFT project that I mentioned a year ago? Well, when 17,731 of you sent me your donuts, it took a little longer than I expected to make. But after lots of code, lots of rendering, and lots of whips, I'm pleased to say that the final NFT will be revealed and announced in two weeks time. It'll be sold and then all of the money will be going to Blender. Subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss it.